very liberating. Uh, I grew a lot. And what I want everybody here to have is as much of that experience as possible. You know, to have a conversation. There's a lot of information out about the Jimmy and with the albums and stuff. And um, you can read that. But Eddie is actually here and he lived the experience the film, if you don't mind the pun. Why don't we start with a little picture on the screen? If you could possibly do the last just a week. More if it's all right with you, little folks. Um, the beginning is, is really what we're going to be talking about is electric radio, and that's the front cover that mm -hmm. Jimmy really wanted. And that was taken by Linda McCartney in Central Park. Um, what we're going to start with today is how the hell did I get there? So that's me at the board at Olympic Studios in 1967, Olympic Studios in London, where I was very fortunate to get a job as a young engineer, and in January of 67, I was very fortunate to get a gig recording with Mr. Jimi Hendrix. Now, we were, as young engineers there in London, we had crossed the road by Jimi and A. Joe had come out, and it was amazing to get this opportunity to work with him. And the funny story was, the studio manager at the time, a lovely lady named Anna Menzies, uh, she called me up on the studio phone and said, Martina, this was a very prim and proper English lady who wore the most beautifully uh, pointed tight skirts with the stockings with the seams in the back. And all of the young engineers, the include, were all in love with her, but she was very far off our We could never get in control. But she, was, she ran that studio with an iron fist. And we all were scared of her. And so she called me up on the phone and she said, Every year, there's this American chappy with the big hair, and he did all that weird shit, so why'd you do him? <laughs> that's literally how I got to record you. <laughs> and uh, it sort of started from there. Um, that's the old. For the tech heads in here, I think there are a few tech heads in here, that's the Helios console, the first one. Fortran. And that's, this, this next picture is slightly clear. You can see there's a little computer pin field there. The beautiful uh, Helios modules, which I still use the copy of uh, today. Um, Fortran, you see the four monitor belts. And the gentleman, I believe, leaning over the console is uh, Eric Berger from The Animals. And the chap with a cigarette behind me is Michael Jeffries. Michael Jeffries was Michael, was, was the guy who uh, was Jimmy's manager. Now, he's ex-MI5, and he was the fact of 38 in the whole school. Don't get me started, because I'll be here all day. So that's how we did our experience and access. So we recorded on the first machine, which was the three, you know, the 352 electronics on its side with the 300 deck like that. And then we record all four tracks, monodrums, guitar, bass, truck, monodrums, guitar, bass, and vocal. And then we dump that as a mix onto the two tracks of the next machine, fill those two up, take those four, mix them back to the first machine, etc. It's a fashion show for you. And he dressed so in unbelievably, and we were trying to sort of try to emulate him. He, he shot for a couple of places in London. One was uh, Granny Takes a Trip. <laughs> Actually, that was the name of the store. And we used to go and shop at Granny Takes a Trip. And um, what's very interesting, I think, about this photograph um, on the console is an acetate. And that acetate is our new experience. We're actually playing back the first acetate of our experience. But what are we doing in the studio? We had already started the next record. We started with access. There was no break. Why was there no break? I mean, was the schedule that tight or was just like some work or just Well, uh, at that time Mr. Hendricks was on the road, and when he wasn't on the road, he was in the studio. It was it seemed like one continuous blur. Uh, I, I just don't remember there not being a break, except when he was away, and I would be doing something with the stones or something like that, which was equally challenging and fun. 
Um, by the way, musicians in those days loved to hear. So you can imagine you were doing a stone session one night, and the next night you're doing Jimmy, and Brian Jones was probably still there from the night before. <laughs> <That's the same. laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I miss that. <laughs> this is the 50th anniversary of oh, that's, that's right. way yeah. um, Can you, as best you can, can you describe that artistic journey that led him to this record that he had full control of? Um, as director and producer, uh, it's, it's sort of like a vague question. Just, yeah, I think Ladyland was Jimmy's hour. He directed it, he produced it, he had the vision in his head of every song, where it was going to go, how it fitted the album. Not only that, but it's also, we can see, uh, if you open up the uh, book, maybe you can show you a picture of that the direction for the album cover design was Jimmy's originally. Everything, all the layouts, who the credits were, I mean, it's just beautifully, beautifully laid out. He had a very clear vision for the final product. It was amazing. But the journey was kind of choppy because in the very beginning, when he started working with Chaz at the record plant, in the sense that he knew this was going to be for the next album after Axis, and he already in his mind was planning this, and he knew he was going to move to America. Um, and then I was encouraged by the record plant, which was this new recording studio in New York City that was just being built, just being completed. Uh, with Gary Calvin, who was, I guess, in Sony, who was a brilliant engineer, um, he put this together. So last shot of Jimmy in the studio, he's listening to a playback. I turn around with my camera. By the way, all these shots are like, I took with a, an old Pentax with, with no flash. And if you want to, you can go to the website. But yeah. that's the last shot. He's listening to phasing and going, oh my god. <laughs> that's what I want you to tell you a story later. Uh, and then this is my first day in America. <laughs> From, it's, I'm at the top of the Empire State Building. It says, voice of Ryan, private recording to you, record your voice, it's fun. <laughs> 50 cents. <laughs> That's the original 50 cents. And then, we'll do that for you. Gary because he took me around on his motorcycle and scared the crap out of me. <laughs> First few months of 1968, this is February, March. I arrived April 17th, 1968, which is when you saw that photograph. Uh, behind him is the 12 track. One inch machine, a piece of garbage. Um, and then the console, which was a Datamix console, um, which is, it was a decent board, but it was so different for me. I come from four track, and all my son was jumping from four to 12. And Jimmy says to me, man, you get more guitars in Yeah, now I've got an accent. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's, you asked the question. Why did it get stopped so many times? That picture tells the story. That's Jimmy Mitchell Noel, who just landed at Miami for Miami Park, and he's um, standing behind him with the telephone of it. And it was a great show. You know, they played on a flatbed truck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the two, who are the two guys who did Miami Park? None other than the two guys who did Woodstock the next year. How do you feel? work together? Were you, were you bringing things out of him? Was he bringing things out of you? Both? What was that? What was that? I think in the beginning, the, the first, like I said, you know, just to quickly zoom back in time, when I first heard that amp, I was, I scared the crap out of me. It was a visceral experience. I, it's emblazing in my memory banks. When he first plugged in at Olympic, and it was, uh, <laughs> what? I gotta record that. Uh, but you know, just your brain gets into another level, and you figure, okay, quickly, what mic? Okay, Bay Area 160 River mic. I know that will take care of that sound. Funny enough, that Bay Area 160 was throughout sessions all the time on the amp on his vocal because he's trying to sing live in the studio, doing a live vocal demo. The M160, because it's a very 
call you like, boy, it's the only thing I can use for a penny summer boy, you know. So that feeling of him coming into the control to hear what I'd done the first time, and he looked at me, and he went, like, mm hmm, okay, let me try this. And he runs back out into the studio and starts filling the controls. Wow, I something. I'm here to record, okay, fine. He comes back, he comes back up. Oh uh, yeah? Hmm. And we kept trying to talk to each other. It was great. It was like, you could do that? Okay, well listen to this. And then once he once he got confident that I whatever he was thinking, I would try to either be, make it slightly better or even better or show him a different way that it could sound, he was happy, he was very confident. So that, that was the beginning of the relationship. But with Electric Ladyland, because of the breakup between him and Chaz, which was quite emotional, I think, because I was so tight, you know. Chaz, thank God for Chaz. Chaz was Jimmy's sidekick, producer, guardian, whatever. And he, Chaz was the one who encouraged Jimmy to write songs, and they actually worked together. Um, so this was a tight relationship about the first two hours, and now he's in America, and Chaz is sitting there, and Jimmy's there at the board, and trying to do stuff, and then half the audience comes into the control room, <laughs> dragging him from the scene club, and that causes this big roof, and so Chaz is now gone, and it's just Jimmy and I to do the, the album, and that solidified the relationship even more, so he had to keep relying on me to sort of Okay, you want the, you want a wild sound? Okay, we'll get some serious ones. So Chaz West left us with a legacy of one phrase that is burned into my brain. The rules are there are no rules. And I said, whatever you do, do whatever you can to make Jimmy sound cool. And Jimmy knew that if he thought of a crazy sound, you know, he would use colors. Hey man. Oh, we give me some of that red. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he had color codes for everything. And, and if he said purple, oh, okay. Well, we know where that went. Yeah, we know where that went. <laughs> so, 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 that's a bit of a technical thing. But what do you feel, not like, and what do you feel he was trying to get across? Uh, and where so social message? Uh, well, 68, as we all know in American history, was a turbulent time. And here's the reason I asked this, because my mom really liked Jimmy Hendrix. And I was surprised when I found out later, and we had really famous friends in our family. You know, Sam Cooke was a really yeah, personal friend of my mom and dad. And um, uh, so the things they liked, I liked. And Jimmy Hendrix seemed like a bit of an outlier. So there's something about him or something about what he was doing that really resonated with her. So I'm trying to get a uh, sense for you of what you thought he was trying to say. Well, the, the obvious part, the, the, the foundation, maybe the core is blues. So it starts there. And then the next layer, when I try to sort of get a mental picture, is discipline. The discipline that Jimmy was subjected to you know, his dad was tough on him, there's no question. But he grew up, uh, you know, in Seattle, as you all know, and playing the guitar very early, and his dad played the guitar, and all those, all those wonderful stories, but very, very disciplined. Um, then he goes into the army, and can ask for more discipline than that, you know, and injures his ankle, and then gets out of the army, and goes on the chitlin circuit uh, with, his, with his buddies. And there's another set of rules. Imagine you're playing with the, the Isley Brothers or Little Richard, and you know, you're doing the steps, right? Boom, 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 with the guitar, you put one foot out of place, $5 fine. Now that was a lot of money in those days. You know? So I think about the blues, the children's circuit, influence of rock and roll, jazz, when you listen to Jimmy's play. I hear Wes Montgomery playing octaves, and then gets to England, and it's the English pop and rock scene, and he's accepted, and that is, that's, he falls in love with England, you know, you can imagine, and blows people away. And I 
keep thinking about these different layers in Jimmy's um, learning curve. Open to everything. I remember going to the hotel, uh, the Hotel Craig in New York, and delivering some tapes for him. And I'm looking at, on the record player, and there's a pile of classical music, like Handel, Bach, Brahms. I say, hey, Jimmy, I didn't know you mentioned classical music. Oh man, I got a lot of my inspiration from that stuff right now. <laughs> the last thing he was able to say, you know, so what was he trying to say? If you, you know, you well, had an Okay, that's right. You're a chick. You're sitting next to me. And, okay, we put up a track. And immediately he says, my man, um, this is not cool. We, let's find the other tape. And he knew every damn take that was on that. Why did I find something else? Like, yeah, okay, what this do? So we'll cut. Those of you who are old enough, and a few of us in the audience, uh, cutting a 24-track or 16-track or an 8-track master tape, chopping the bits out. We got no protons, dude. I love the idea of freak out and blues and all of that because it's so much part of what Jimmy does. I mean, a freak out on stage from him would be like just blowing your mind with ridiculous things he does on the guitar. Um, destroying it, feedback, smashing, and all the rest of that. And then the blues are being always the root thing that's holding it all together. And um, yeah, the rest of it is just fairy dust on the top, you know what I mean? Fairy dust, sprinkling. Um, I'm going to play you in the, um, in the process of Jimmy writing and putting Electric Lady Line together. He was in the Drake Hotel, I think we mentioned that. And he had a tape machine, a quarter inch, quarter track tape machine, a couple of mics, uh, a small amp, really tiny amp, but an acoustic guitar as well. This is like a semi acoustic guitar in Jimmy's voice. He recorded this. This is the demo for a called Cat, it's called Angel Katarina, but it became 1983. And you'll hear the process from hotel demo to the demo demo before the actual master. So, uh, would you mind playing that, please? And I just have to make a comment about what you just said. Technology, modern technology today, just caught up with Jimmy Hendricks. <laughs> so that's me standing behind which Now, the reason why Electric Lady Land took so bloody long is because Jimmy had gone the road and made money. So we're down in Miami for Miami Pop. Talk, talk to you about that. That's Mitch, and he's about to dive off out about pushing. Um, but what you don't see, by the way, Linda McCartney took this picture, or Linda Eastman. Now, the next picture I can't show you, did it? Because we came out of the water, we came up to the diving board again, and Mitch is in front of his two handy, uh, what do you really want to call them? Ornament. Oh, yes. oh, 